It was 2009, and I decided to pull the trigger. See, I had received a phone call, and it was my buddy and brother, and they're like, dude, you just got to do it. You just have to pull the trigger. I know it's only 24-hour notice, but you don't have to buy the ticket. You just have to get up to Chicago. So I get off the phone, I research flights, and as you can imagine, they weren't cheap. So I'm weighing the pros and cons. Is this really worth it? They say it's a a once-in-a-lifetime experience, but man, at what cost? I decide to pull the trigger. I bought the plane tickets. I fly to Chicago. I land, and there they are in the car ready to pick me up. We're driving to our destination. I have never had seen traffic like I had seen traffic, and I'd lived in California, so it was heavy. And then all of these lanes, like five lanes of cars, are all converging into one single lane to where there's a dude taking money. And it's like, you can't turn around. You're stuck. And so finally, we get to this guy, and he says, it's going to be $75. And we're like, to park a car? He's like, yeah, meaning you can't turn around. I got you. So I hand him my credit card. He swipes it. We go park the car. We still have to walk like a mile. And as we're walking, brother, friend, they're stoked. And here I am just in my mind, like, what did I just do? Like, I spent so much money to get here, and I don't know if it's worth it. In fact, I know for the price, it's not worth it. We get to where we're going, and I'm sitting there just full of regret and sorrow and just thinking to myself, what did I do? Once in a lifetime, I'm going to be paying for this for the rest of my life. And then the lights go down, and this song starts to play. Maybe. And goosebumps come across my arm. And all of the sorrow, all of the regret, all of the money that it took to get there went away. And for the next three hours, I experienced the best period, concert period, of my life, period. In 2009, I got to fly to Chicago to see U2 at Soldier Field, and it was amazing. In fact, every time I hear that song, I'm just seated where I was and getting to experience this once-in-a-lifetime experience. Isn't it crazy how music can do that? Like, I can transport back into time. There are songs that I can listen to that can take me back to high school, songs that I can listen to that that bring up uh, joy and can get me psyched up to go do something. You guys with me? Like, maybe your genre of music's not the same as mine. Perhaps your music tastes a little different, but when you hear that song or a song, it invokes memories, feelings, and locks emotion unlike most things can. This summer, we've been looking at the Psalms. And I love the Psalms because it's just raw emotion. In fact, there isn't really a human emotion that is not expressed in the Psalms. We can go to Psalms and find all human emotion. And we can name it and we can see how they're processing their relationship with God, their relationship with people. There's so many genres in Psalms, and and we get to see psalms of lament and confidence and remembrance and kingship, wisdom, thanksgiving, penitential psalms. The psalms to Israel weren't too different like they are, uh, music is to us today. The psalms helped Israel and can help us to align our thoughts to God, God's story, and align our emotions to God's heart. Today, we're going to be looking at Psalm 67. If you have your Bible, you can flip there now. Um, And this song would have been a song that Israel sung. And as they were singing it, it would have transported them back to remember God's grand story and how they fit in it and how their emotions are to align to God's heart. And the same way it did for Israel, my hope, my prayer today is that it does the same for us as well as we're looking at the Psalms. Psalm 67, it doesn't, it's kind of harder to fit into one of these genres, but if we had to, I'd put it in the genre of, of thanksgiving. And what I appreciate most about Psalm 67 is it's pretty straightforward in stating its purpose um, and theme right out the gate. And so, um, in fact, the first two verses, you can kind of see what the purpose of this psalm is. And so if you have your Bibles, 
Go ahead and turn there. Your smartphones, you can fire them up. If you don't have it, we'll have it on the screen right here. But here we go. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to unpack it just a little bit, and we'll be on our merry little way. So Mary, uh, Psalm 67, verse 1 through 7. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the people praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. All right, right out of the gate, here's the bottom line. If you don't get anything else out of today, here's what I want us to all walk away with. God blesses us that we might be a blessing to all peoples everywhere. And that's a real simple bottom line, but I would argue it's probably one of the hardest to apply in our everyday life. God blesses us so that we might be a blessing to all peoples everywhere. Everywhere, but we see this in the first two verses. Check out verse one. It starts this way May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. We just sang that just a second ago, and might I add, they did a fantastic job. Their voices, man, they can just soothe an angel, can't they? Kenny and Haley, they did an amazing job. Give it up for them. But we just sang that song, but this isn't just a song that we sing on Sunday or Carrie Job kind of covered or wrote. But this is actually uh, words that are taken from a priestly blessing in number six. And I appreciate the way this psalm starts, Psalm 67, with these words. Why? Because it's a cry for mercy. This psalmist here tells us that we all come to God in one way, and that's in need. Our primary need for God is his mercy. And so the psalmist is requesting here three things. He's saying, God, we need your grace, we need your blessing, and we need your presence. He's saying, God, we we need your grace, your unmerited favor on us. We need your attentiveness to us that we don't deserve, but but he gives uh, gives to us out of his love for us. God, we need your blessing. That's the fullest state of human favor on us or excuse me, the fullest state of human joy found in God. He's asking for his blessing. And then we see for his face to shine upon us, which in the Old Testament is a theme for God's presence. For example, you could look at uh, the book of Jonah. You can see all throughout Jonah, there's this theme you read where every time it says Jonah is running away from the face of God or God's face, It's not literally running away from God's face, but instead what's really meant is he's trying to run away from God's presence. And so we see that we need God's grace, his blessing, and his presence. But what makes this blessing unique is that it doesn't just satisfy our felt needs. It's satisfying at a soul level. Our felt needs are, are the things that God gives us, and those are good But there's something deeper within that. There's a felt need that we see that is met here at a soul level. And it's this. It's God himself. That is the blessing. See, a lot of times I think about the things that I need and that God gives me. Or I think about the the love of of God and and the things that it, it accomplishes or it gives to me. But I don't necessarily think about God himself being the blessing. My priorities are misaligned because of that. See, problems don't arise because we need things or love things. Problems arise when we get confused about what we need or we get disoriented about what we love. An illustration I give for this is, is my youngest daughter, she loves her iPad, or she doesn't love her iPad. That just proves my point in a second. Um, she really likes her iPad. She thinks she needs her iPad to the point where we're trying to break her of this habit of watching her iPad. And as a result, she'll ask if she can watch it. I'll say, no, you, you, don't, you don't need your iPad. Oh, but I need my iPad. No, you don't need your iPad. Oh, but I love my iPad. And it's like cute, but annoying all at the same time. No, you don't love 
your iPad. By no means that she actually needed or love it, right? But when she's tired and being selfish and not in the right state of mind, her priority and reality is skewed. And it's the same with us. And so that's where verse 1 comes in. And it's making it clear what we need. It's reorienting, reorienting our, our affection to what should captivate our love. And at the core of God's blessing is that we get God. That's the plea of verse 1. We need you, God. At a soul level, it's he who satisfies us. We get a God who is faithful, who is joy and peace. We get to know the one who doesn't fail. We get to know the one who delivers, who provides and gives us his presence. That's verse 1. Verse 2, what comes next is, as believers, I would argue, is one of the most significant verses or can be the most significant verse in our lives. And it's comical because I'm up here speaking publicly and I'm about to give a minor, though not a big one, but a, to me a big one, a grammar lesson. I, by no means do I have the business of doing this. I am not qualified. My English teachers would hopefully be proud of me. My wife would probably be wondering where I'm going with this because grammar is not my thing by any means. But we see in verse one to two, a huge grammatical impact. It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, comma. Not period, comma. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all the nations. This comma is so incredibly important for us to understand because if you're anything like me, I don't necessarily like a comma here. We like to put a period here. May God be gracious to us, period. May God bless us, period. May God's presence be with us, period. I might be the only one in this room, but I'll be vulnerable with you. But a lot of times I want a version one, uh, a verse one version of Christianity where I'm just the passive recipient of God's grace. I think a lot of times we're all like that. But that's not what's being said here. We actually see that verse 1 flows into verse 2. And we can't have verse 2 without verse 1. And what I love about these verses is they don't just stand alone. The psalmist singing this wouldn't have all of a sudden been like, oh my gosh, we're blessed and now we're supposed to be a blessing? And we shouldn't be reading these words shocked. Oh, I didn't know I'm blessed, now I'm to be a blessing. In fact, we can go all the way back, and as the psalmist was singing this, they would have been transported all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, where Genesis chapter 12 says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make, your, uh, make you a, nation, a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, comma, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And in him who dishonors you, I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Friends, salvation was God's ultimate motivation in making Abraham's name great. Not just for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, but for the nations, all nations. Centuries later, the Apostle Paul actually calls this promise to Abraham the gospel. Check out Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. It says, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So from Genesis to Psalms to Galatians to Revelations, we see the flow of God's purpose. And his purpose is this, that, that he blesses us so that his way may be known on the earth, his saving power among all nations. And connecting verse 1 and 2 in our life is so essential to plugging into the flow of what God is doing in our world. And this is the flow of God's story in and through us. And this is the flow 
all the way through the New Testament. In fact, this is the flow of, of what being a Christ follower is, that we are a saved and sent people. We are blessed to be a blessing. Check out this theme throughout the New Testament. I'm just going to fire off a few verses just so you can kind of see this theme. But uh, when Jesus appears to his disciples after the resurrection in John 20, 21, it says, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father sent me, even though, or I, even so I am sending you. Jesus was asked what the most important commandment was in Mark 12, and he said, the most important hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love people. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Romans 10, 14. Then how then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is the flow of God's story, his blessing in and through us. The gospel doesn't just end when I come to know Jesus. It doesn't stop. The gospel is not about your self-improvement. It's not about religious affiliation. It's not about the connectiveness socially that you get by coming to church, it's not just another additive in your life. The gospel is that you and I started our journey dead in our sin and that we were separated from a holy God without hope and deep need of rescue. It's about the God of the universe meeting you where you're at, shining the light of hope into your darkness, reconciling you to himself through the cross of Jesus breathing life into you and bringing you into the story of what he is doing around the world. That is the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. And that's the blessing that we get to participate in and then get to bless people in. The blessing of God has been described to me kind of this way. It's kind of like a river. And... Um, when we come to know Jesus, Jesus just wants us to jump in. Jump into that river. See, ooh, that's a pretty picture. You jump into that river and just let it take you. But a lot of times we kind of want to live with like one foot in, one foot out. We want to kind of dip the, the cup in on the edge of the bank on our terms. And we miss the entire purpose for which we've been saved in the first place. God wants us to jump in and see where he will take us. And what I love about Psalm 67, we can go to verse 3 through 7, and we can see where this river is taking us, where it's going. Verse 3, it says, Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity, and you guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Do you see that in verse 3? Let who praise you? Let the peoples praise you. How many people? All the peoples. Let all peoples praise you. Not just you, not just me. Let all the peoples praise you. The story doesn't stop with you and me. It doesn't stop here in Ottawa or Chattanooga or East Tennessee or the Southeast or America. But it goes to the ends of the earth, ultimately to the end of the story, the cosmic praise of God that we talked about in fall in the fall, back in Revelation chapter 5, when the apostle John writes, And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, and people, and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God. So back to Psalm 67. Then it says, After let all the peoples praise you, it says, Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. And I love this section. I love this verse. I love that it says, let the nations be glad and to sing for joy. Why do I love it so much? Because I know that God wants to be known, but a lot of times I fall short and, and I forget that God actually wants to be enjoyed also. See, God doesn't want to just be known. He wants to be enjoyed. So what does enjoying God look like? 
author and pastor Sam Storms put it this, uh, puts it this way. Enjoying God is to know God intellectually, to admire God and his beauty, to delight in him emotionally, and to, uh, to dedicate oneself to him. In essence, to enjoy God is to praise God for the God that he is. C.S. Lewis really captures this when he says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is the appointed consummation. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until expressed. It's frustrating to have discovered a new author and not be able to tell anyone about how good he is. To come suddenly to the turn of the road upon the mountain valley of unexpected grandeur and then to have to keep silent because the people you care for or the people you're with care for it no more than a tin can in a ditch. To hear a good joke and to find no one to share with it. In my words, what I would say, it's, it's no different than how could I not go to a U2 concert and take a selfie and post it on social media? Or how could I not go to Top Gun Maverick and tell you how awesome it is and want to call my dad and my brothers and my best friends like, you have to go see this movie. How can I not go to Yosemite Valley and come around the bend and take another selfie just to prove that I was there? I used to have long hair. <laughs> Our God wants to be enjoyed. And Lewis really just helped us see when God is enjoyed for who he is, it has to find somewhere to be, somewhere to land, somewhere to be shared. I remember leading a mission trip to Greece with a group of students who were hesitant because of the group of uh, people we were going to be working with, and the parents were hesitant because there was a, um, some social unrest. Go, well, they were going through some, some government uh, political stuff. And once we got there and started to interact with the people, God began to move and stir not only into the affections of the people where they came to know Jesus, but, but our students got to experience God in a new and a fresh way to where they began to wake up excited about the next day and the next day and the next day just to see what God was going to do. In fact, one of those students came back and he was on a football team and, and he's like, I'm going to start a Bible study with, with all these guys. And he was pretty influential on the team to where all these guys started to come to this Bible study and, and he was just sharing Jesus with them because that's all he could do. That's all he knew to do. He wanted to see God show up in ways that he had never seen before. And as a result, God showed up. And students' lives were changed. The joy that he had in God was overflowing, and it had to find a place to land. See, when God becomes your ultimate joy, you can't keep him from anyone. Psalm 67 is looking into the future when God will bless his people, and the nations will come to know his saving power. But you and I get to read Psalm 67 and know that this saving power comes and is available through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus who secured for the nation this blessing, the blessing that Psalm 67 was anticipating. I find it interesting as Jesus was leaving his earthly ministry and ascends up to heaven, right before he does this, he leads his followers out as far out as Bethany and lifting up his hands, it says he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried so by blessing his church, Jesus began the day envisioned here in Psalms 67. And that's where the Great Commission in Acts 1.8 comes in, where he can say, empowered through the Holy Spirit, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Why? Because God has blessed us through Jesus so that we might be a blessing to all peoples everywhere. This is the mission of God to go to the ends of the earth, reaching people with the good news of Jesus. We get to share how Jesus has transformed our lives. We get to share that gospel, that life-changing reality of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then we get to stand back and just see what God does with that. You see, if we are in Christ, we are to make known on the earth the saving power of God. We are to make much of Jesus with our families, with our friends, with our co-workers, with our neighbors, to the ends of the earth. And this isn't just something that we keep to ourselves. It's something that we just enjoy on our own. 
but instead we want others to experience this blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. So what? What does this mean for you and for me? I don't know if you've heard, I'm sure you have, the, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. I'll put it up there. Um, one's beautiful and the other one's dead. <laughs> Look at it. Um, I know it's cool to go float in the Dead Sea, but I mean, it's lifeless. Nothing is in there that, that can live. It's 10 times saltier than the ocean. And then you have this other body of water, the Sea of Galilee, that just, it, it just life flourishes, farming and, and recreation. And, and it just looks majestic and beautiful. What's interesting about these two pictures is they're both fed by the same river. You see, the Sea of Galilee is up to the north and Dead Sea is to the south in Israel. And you have the Jordan River running right through it. And, and what's interesting, the Sea of Galilee is fed by the Jordan, a freshwater source. And then on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River continues. So there's an in and an out. But then you further you go down to the Jordan River and you keep going to the south part of Israel. And then the Jordan River just fills up the Dead Sea. The difference is the Dead Sea doesn't have an outlet. It just collects this water and it has nowhere to go. And as a result, it just collects water and it doesn't do anything. It just ends up stagnant where nothing can live or survive. And I think this is a great example for us to ask, what kind of people or church do we want to be? This is a tale of two people or two churches. Do we want to be a church that looks like the Sea of Galilee or uh, the Dead Sea? Do we want to be like the Sea of Galilee with, with the blessing of God and the love of God that flows in us but doesn't stop with us? It flows from us and continues to flow into the people around us, into the places around us that we would be a life-giving people and a life-giving church versus a consuming people a consuming church where the love of God or the blessing of God just stops. What would it look like for us to stop putting a period where God put a comma? What kind of person, what kind of church do we want to be? A place where the love of God doesn't just stop on us, but it flows through us into the world. I pray that we desire to be the kind of people, the kind of church with the blessing of God that doesn't just stop on us, but it continues to flow in and through us to all peoples everywhere. So as we close, I just want to ask us a few questions. Maybe you want to write them down, get your phone out. You can reflect on them this week, but are you experiencing the joy of God's presence and the blessing that that brings? What are those intangible blessings that come from him and his presence? Oftentimes, we think about him and just the stuff uh, that he gives us or the things that we need. But, but how have you experienced his presence and the joy that that brings? The second question I'd love for us to ask is, how do we make sure we don't put a period where God puts a comma? Another way I'd say it is this week, how can we be a blessing with the people that God brings around us, that, brings our, that, that he brings our way? So as we close, I want to try a little experiment. So go ahead and bow your heads. I just want to take a moment real quick and ask the Lord and to ask the Holy Spirit to drop maybe some names of, of who we need to bless or, or some ideas. Maybe we have the names, but we need some ideas of how to bless people this week. And so just ask God now, God speak, bring me names, bring me ideas of how I can be a blessing to other people I come in contact with this week.
maybe people or names that come to mind immediately, but if not, that's okay. This week, I pray that you're asking God that question, and maybe it's on your walk. The Lord makes it real clear, or on your commute to work tomorrow, or maybe you get a text from someone, and, and, and you just know exactly how you can be a blessing in that moment, but pray that we can walk in obedience this week to what God asks of us of how we can be a blessing to the people he has placed in our life. So God, we we thank you for this morning. We thank you that, Lord, it's so simple yet so difficult to live out of being blessed so that we can be a blessing. God, the reality is we need your spirit to guide us, to speak to us, to bring people across our path where we can be a blessing. God, would you empower us to boldly be these kinds of people? Would Two Rivers be a place where we are a life-giving body of water to the land around us, where your love and your blessings flow in and through us to all people everywhere, in our schools, our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our homes. Allow us to be the people showing your love and blessing so that your way may be known on the earth, that your saving power is known among our neighborhoods, among our schools, among our workplaces, among our community. And God, as we're doing this, I pray that you can increase our joy, that we can see you moving and working in the in the lives around us, and that just bubbles up in us an excitement to wake up every day and to continue to walk in this blessing. God, help us to be a people where we just can't stop sharing about the love of God and us enjoying him or you. God, we thank you this morning for allowing us to be, a, uh, to be the church. Help us to be the church as we leave here today, as we bless others. God, we thank you for this time, and we love you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.